Hello, my name is Anna Ovchinikova. I'm the project manager for the National Archive of Data on Arts and Culture. Also here with me today is NADAC's director, Lynette Holter. Thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar, 2021 Profile of Arts Incubators, a growing phenomenon in the universe of cultural organizations. We are joined by Dr. Stan Rennert, the Associate Dean and Coordinator of Arts Management and Entrepreneurship at the uh, Wein um, Wenzenhofer uh, Family College of Fine Arts at the University of Oklahoma. Dr. Rennert is also the Director of the Arts Incubation Research Lab, or also known as AIR Lab, at the University of Texas at San Antonio. Dr. Renard will be leading today's presentation, but before we turn it over to him, I'd like to uh, briefly tell you about the structure of this webinar. Uh, we'll begin with a brief introduction to NADAC, uh, followed by an, uh, an overview of uh, NEA Research Awards programs. Then we'll turn the presentation over to Dr. Renard, and he will tell us about what Arts Incubator is, uh, what services they provide, uh, who they serve, and then he will walk us through initial findings uh, of two year of study uh, of the universe of arts incubators. At the end of the uh, webinar, we will be happy to take your questions. The National Archive of Data on Arts and Culture, or NADAC, is an online repository of arts related data funded by the National uh, Endowment for the Arts. NADAC is housed at ICPSR at the University of Michigan. Researchers, arts managers, uh, policymakers, and uh, the general public can access NADAC at www.icpsr.umich.edu forward slash NADAC and discover, access, and download absolutely free of charge over 160 arts related studies. Uh, um, many of them are also available for online analysis. Uh, you can also search and compare over 90,000 variables and peruse over 1,000 data-related publications. Researchers can also uh, submit their own data for deposit in NADAC. In addition, we uh, offer user support to assist data users with finding and obtaining data. Uh, the project led by Dr. Rennert, the Arts Incubation Research Lab, is an example of a project funded through the NEA uh, Research Labs program, which is one of the funding mechanisms available to researchers through the National Endowment for the Arts. The research grants in the arts is another funding option, and we encourage you to learn more about these programs on the NEA website at www.arts.gov forward slash grants. Better yet, uh, mark your calendars uh, and join us on April 18th at 1 p.m. Uh, to learn more about any uh, research award guidelines, uh, ask your questions, and even meet uh, ORDs that use large-scale data sets uh, that uh, some of them are also available at NADAC. And now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Renard. Thank you, Anna. Um... Welcome everyone, and um, I'm, I'm so pleased to uh, have been invited to present uh, this um, uh, two years of uh, work that uh, the Air Lab uh, has produced and uh, culminated in the 2021 Profile of Arts Incubators. Um, I am um, you know, the director of a lab at a distant university where I in San Antonio, Texas, and but I work at the University of Oklahoma. And um, so my uh, that was my previous institution, and I still direct the lab from the distance. And I want to thank the National Endowment for the Arts for uh, supporting the lab for the past two years. Next slide, please. All right, so what are arts incubators? Uh, arts incubators are, are first very interesting organizations. They have many forms, they are all unique. And uh, they usually um, have a single uh, you know, role. 
is to nurture smaller emerging artists and cultural organizations. Um, they usually deliver some uh, training and mentorship in business and entrepreneurial skill. Um, this is very much like the framing of uh, how we consider arts incubators. So it's not necessarily um, the idea that arts incubators train you to be better artists. It's, the, uh, you know, we looked at arts incubators that had very much an entrepreneurship uh, and uh, business uh, training ground for artists. Um, so they, they did, of course, those uh, skills support uh, artistic and creative innovation. So that's very much um, kind of the framing of what arts incubators in essence uh, do, or at least the ones that we study. Um, they tend to uh, serve, again, artists in early stages of development. And perhaps that's the difference between an arts incubator and an arts accelerator. So if you are an arts incubator, you uh, you serve artists in early stages of development. Same thing with arts uh, cultural organization. An arts ac accelerator will be uh, later on. So usually you have already fairly sustainable uh, operation businesses, and then you uh, bring them to the next level. Um, uh, a lot of these programs uh, have been done in person uh, or virtual, certainly during the COVID time. Uh, many programs were very nimble and uh, able to provide their services online. And uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that as we move forward. Uh, next slide, please. So here is um, uh, a picture of um, one of those incubators and a space uh, within uh, an incubator called 20, uh, 2112 in Chicago, uh, which is just about four uh, exit stops south of O'Hare Airport uh, on, the, on the commuter line. Um, so it, it, this is a very interesting arts incubator. Uh, it has, as you can see, something that looks very much like a co-op space. And all of these uh, businesses and, and these uh, uh, these folks who work there, uh, you know, operate art-centric type operations or, or ventures. And uh, what we don't see on this picture is, is on the other side of that wall, there is also, uh, you know, a wide range of uh, music studios and rehearsal spaces that uh, can have the capacity to um, serve about a thousand musicians. So it's really quite incredible as a space, um, very much uh, set up as uh, LLC or, you know, a, a for-profit, uh, you know, operation. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, the, the, the picture that we just saw that was uh, an arts incubator that is set up as a for-profit, but most arts incubator tends to be non-profits. Uh, some are, are government entities. Um, an example of a uh, government uh, supported our arts incubator will be uh, Creative Labs Hawaii uh, and uh, and so forth. And, and some have hybrid legal statuses like uh, LC Freeze, for instance. Um, all right, so uh, sometimes incubators are operated by local arts agencies. Actually, a part of the study, um, uh, and, and I need to acknowledge uh, our, our partners, which are the Americans for the Arts. They are research partners on this study and uh, helped us all along the way. And how we identified the arts uh, incubators for this study, which is about 400 of them, uh, was done through the, uh, the yearly um, local arts agency survey that is released by the Americans for the arts. And they, um, they reach about 5,000 local arts agencies. And uh, one of the final questions in the survey uh, in 2021 was, uh, do you know of any arts incubators in your community? And we provided a definition of what an arts incubator was, uh, at least in, in our mind. And, uh, and so we were able to crowdsource that information to a great degree, which was very, very useful. Um, so many arts incubators don't have actually incubator in the name of arts incubator, which makes it difficult sometimes to like identify 
uh, which ones are Atsuki incubators. Also, uh, through um, you know many uh, interviews and focus groups that I conducted and my team conducted, um, we learned that you know uh, a lot of those incubators actually don't view themselves as incubators uh, and you know don't even think of themselves as an incubator and once they they were um you know um introduced to like the, the concept and, and and then the definition that we had they said oh yeah we are an incubator after all yeah absolutely that's what we do um so uh okay uh so just about 400 arts incubators have been documented so far by the lab. Uh, I'm certain there are more, but uh, you know we have uh, the, that data set keeps growing and uh, hopefully will live within the NADAC um, the repository uh, for all of you to access. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Okay, so this is um, uh, you know a, a quick uh, infographic that indicates that 84% of the um, survey respondents who were identified as arts incubators by uh, you know the LAA survey, uh, as well as uh, independent collection of data uh, by the lab. Um, responded that they are set up as nonprofits uh, organizations or 501 C3s. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's a map uh, where I had those 400 incubators that I just mentioned uh, as pins on this map. You see some red pins. The red pins as are represent the 15 arch incubators that the lab studied in depth. Uh, and they are a little bit all over the country. Um, and uh, I guess next slide, please. So here is... Uh, uh, a picture of uh, the L1 accelerator. Uh, it's called accelerator, but this one is actually an incubator in, in, in many ways. Um, but uh, it's part of the uh, public plus life, uh, uh, you know, uh, incubator at uh, which is part of the University of Chicago to some degrees funded by the University of Chicago, but it's on, in South Chicago and serves uh, a BIPOC community of artists in, in, that, um, in that part of town. And uh, what the L1 is, is actually uh, is located in uh, a refurbished um, old train station. And it's basically uh, a brick and mortar outlet for the artists who were fellows in that uh, incubator program to um, uh, to showcase their work. Uh, and it's, they were usually folks who were um, and artists and creatives who were selling their um, uh, their creative content online. And, uh, you know, and, and instead of going from brick and mortar to online, that particular incubator decided, hey, why don't we go from online to brick and mortar and gave a chance to for those artists to uh, have some uh, experience selling. Uh, and uh, so they have your, uh, hours of operations and, uh, you know, the, um, you know the, the, all the product are created by about a dozen artists. And uh, the folks who operate that particular uh, retail space are those artists. And so they, they basically sell each other's, uh, you know, product to tourists or folks who uh, come by and visit the store. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, those are very much uh, some of um, not only the services, but um kind of like the the anchors of what those uh the foundational core of what arts incubators pro, uh, provide they don't have to provide all of this but uh many of them do uh so uh one of the core activities that arts incubators provide is uh, education uh, an educational training group. So, um, and that can look very different uh, from, uh, uh, you know, if you look at different arts incubators in a country, some of them will have a curriculum and it will be uh, very much uh, structured and they'll be almost like, you know, 
to similar to like you know boot camp perhaps a model or uh, perhaps a workshop model um others will have perhaps a project based and experiential uh type uh learning um uh, uh, methodology and and thus there will be no um no no uh, uh guided lessons or anything like that and um you know, so the learning, the leadership skills are learned as part of the project as it is done. Um, uh, mentoring is is huge. Uh, most arts incubator have a mentoring element in uh, in uh, in play. Um, for ex uh, example, uh, a, a great uh, arts incubator is the first people's fund in South Dakota, in Rapid City, South Dakota. Um, they serve uh, uh, native artists uh, from all over the country. And their mentoring system, uh, you know, uh, sends uh, one uh, artist coach and one business coach to the artists who often live in very remote areas. Uh, so it's it's a very interesting model and they have uh, an exchange of, of, of funds, uh, you know, within, uh, you know, their network and they have the ability to connect with those artists. So usually, usually the artist coach will be in a discipline, will be an, an expert in a discipline that the artist wishes to, uh, to grow in uh, and so forth. Um, but also, um, you know, there are multiple cohorts that go through those arts incubators just and building a, a pretty strong and, 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 a, and a, um, an important alumni network that, um, you know, then a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning can happen through that, uh, through that model. Thus, networking events are always uh, very important. Um, they can happen online, they can happen in person. Not all arts incubators have uh, a facilities or a space, a physical space. Uh, some of them, um, you know, actually don't have a physical space. They might have offices, but none of the work is done in that space and they reach usually more communities. Um, rather than, uh, you know, have a space and reach the local community. So there's different models out there. Um, there are certainly an access point for raising funds. Either they provide funds themselves or uh, they have uh, partners that, you know, uh, can provide some uh, either seed capital or grants or, uh, or loans and so forth. If, uh, you know, the, the one very important uh, element that incubators which had a physical space uh, or have a physical space provide is uh, Internet Access Hub. And, and that, that is essential because uh, a lot of the time digital divide is often, uh, you know, the barrier for artists to um to have access to uh, the, the market that they need to be uh, connected to, which is often online. Um, so of course there's the space and the spaces, you know, vary uh, for different things. Uh, each arts incubator might specialize in serving uh, either uh, a particular uh, uh, discipline. So it might be that they only work with visual artists, or it might be that they only work with musicians. So if you think about uh, the Austin Music Foundation, they only work with musicians, you know, uh, whereas you have other arts incubators who work with multiple art forms, like say C in San Antonio. Um, anything from video game design to journalism to uh, painting and visual arts. Um, Finally, uh, a lot of these arts incubators may act as a fiscal sponsor, a great example of uh, an arts incubator um, uh, that um, uh, act as a fiscal sponsor is Intersection for the Arts in San Francisco. And uh, they have the ability to, uh, for, to take care of that uh, fiscal and accounting uh, and payroll issues that uh, perhaps other arts incubators don't have, other arts organizations uh, don't have the capacity to absorb because of their budgets. Um, uh, next, please. Next slide, please. Okay. So here is, uh, you know, uh, from uh, the survey that we conducted of the uh, about 147 
our arts incubators across the country. We've learned that uh, about 83% of the participants who attended in one of those programs completed the whole program. So they, are, they tend to be highly successful. They tend to have um, our arts incubator programs tend to have like uh, um, a high uh, retention rate uh, that it be online or that it be in person. And uh, so there's a lot to be proud of here. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here is um, an art incubator in Oakland, uh, California. It used to be called Do Labs, and now it's called the Black Music Incubator. Uh, so it changed hands, and but the space is still there. Um, it is, this is not a space that only, you know, paid, is catered to musicians. They also have visual artists, they have writers, they have uh, creative writers, all sorts of, of creatives in this space. It's a very beautiful space. Um, most of the spaces tend to be uh, in industrial settings, and they perhaps are not always easy to find. Uh, they, they don't necessarily want you to know that they have, you know, you know, a beautiful facility inside and, uh, and then perhaps expensive gear. And uh, so that's uh, often uh, one of uh, the trends that I've seen uh, during my travels. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so when we talk about networking, uh, those are like, you know, again, uh, some of the elements that I discussed earlier, but uh, I wanted to expand a little bit more on this. Um, the networking is, is essential because this is, you know, how uh, a lot of the time we have access to information that otherwise we don't have. We connect with peers, we connect with met network uh, mentors and so forth. And, um, and, and that's perhaps one of the most valuable, uh, you know, um, service that an arts incubator can provide. Uh, the exchange of information, information is everything. And, um, uh, and then, uh, of course, developing a you know, professional and uh, the, the professional contact, but also finding other folks who are going through perhaps the same struggles as, as you are. Uh, the facilities uh, tend to be, um, depending on the business model of an arts incubator, uh, sometimes the facilities are subsidized. So they're like your, your low cost access facilities over uh, arts incubator might have perhaps uh, a co-op space model. So you rent uh, a desk or you rent an office or you rent a space to, 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 uh, to practice your art. And then usually as a perk, as part of that, you also have access to training and uh, mentorship and uh, you know, leadership sk skills, uh, workshops and, and, and so forth. Um, and again, depending on uh, what that the incubator specializes in, they might have, they might look very different. Some of them might be a kind of makerspace type model and maybe have a fab lab or something of this nature. Um, some, some of the spaces have galleries and they're exhibiting work by the artists who are, uh, you know, using the space. Um, there are a lot of performing arts, uh, you know, spaces and venues. Uh, they might be recording studios. They might be podcasting like studios. They might be like photo shoot. Uh, and usually they have they try, you know, a lot of art incubators will connect the two together. They'll connect the service and of the industry with the creatives. And so it's a win-win usually. Um, uh, in terms of services that uh, art incubators provide, which I already like, mentioned some of those, there are usually some business services uh, beyond, beyond the, the training. Uh, and some of the services might be some uh, marketing uh, and uh, you know, some graphic design marketing type services, maybe some bookkeeping, uh, you know, maybe some joint reception, um, some shared office equipment, uh, and so forth. Um, uh, there is also material sometimes that is created by the instructional staff that is uh, in-house and or that is co-created and that um, um, the uh, incubatees have access to. Um, some arts incubators provide funding um, and us uh, or uh, have, you know, access or provide resources uh, where to find funding. So uh, those are usually can have, you know, many different type of 
uh, they can look different. You know, it can be grants, it can be loans, it can be equity investments at time, uh, it can be seed money, it can be all sorts of things. You know, you know, angel, uh, angel investment funds. Uh, yeah, I've seen all sorts of different mechanisms out there. Again, every arts incubator is, is absolutely unique. Uh, and of course, the uh, fiscal sponsorship and the, uh, the ability to uh, to have uh, that tax exempt status by extension, uh, allowing these organization to accept donations and uh, support um, just as a uh, uh, 501c3 would. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, a picture of uh, one of the spaces within uh, the Creative Labs Hawaii, uh, you know, complex. And uh, this is, uh, you know, a, a video photo shoot studio. Uh, and um, they, uh, Creative Labs Hawaii is truly, uh, you know, an, an exceptional, uh, you know, arts incubator that does really amazing things for the community of artists in Hawaii, and especially they're extremely successful in um, having uh, the ability to export uh, the work of those artists into the mainland, as you, you know, as they are uh, kind of, you know, um, um, uh, want to say that, uh, you know, enclaved on an island, uh, the, their market is very small on the island. And so most of the, the work that is created uh, tends to be exported and they have um, wonderful connection in, uh, in LA and the ability to license a lot of the work, uh, which, you know, has been, um, uh, you know, produced and, 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 uh, and, and licensed to Disney, to different commercials, to different uh, movie studios, and they, they are really uh, seeing a lot of traction, a lot of success. Um, this particular studio, uh, it's a fairly, it's not a huge space, but, uh, you know, it has produced anything from, you know, Dog the Bounty Hunter to uh, when I was there, they were just finishing uh, a photo shoot of uh, with a model uh, for um, uh, uh, bathing suits, okay, uh, and, and a whole line. So they 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 they, cert they certainly have this connection to uh, the commercial industry, and that is very much their business model. So even though they and they are government uh, a supported initiative, uh, and, and really kind of a really really fun. Uh, space to to visit a lot of uh, very um, entrepreneurial people in in the space, uh, but they also have a co-op space in there. They have offices and lots of businesses, um, you know, kind of, kind of living there. Okay, next slide, please. So, who do uh, arts incubators serve? Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so they serve artists all over the United States. These, um, uh, all the dots in there represent like uh, artists that these 15 incubators that uh, we've studied in depth serve. And then as for 15 incubators, that was about like 1500 artists. So, uh, you know, over time. Um, and, um, you know, depending uh, who, uh, what the business model of the incubator is, they might serve uh, few communities or many communities. So, for instance, an example of uh, arts incubators that serve many uh, communities across the country would be uh, Creative Capital or would be um, uh, the national art strategies, uh, they don't tend to, they tend to not have a space where they, uh, you know, coach those, um, those artists in, uh, in entrepreneurial and business uh, skills, but uh, they go, sometimes they will have a space uh, in, in different parts of the country where they'll do so, and, uh, and certainly a lot of the work is done online. But they have the ability to serve dozens of communities. So that's their, that's their model. They, they want to serve many, many communities all around the country. The First People's Fund is very similar model, but it's um, uh, the difference between the two is one 
uh, First Peoples Fund, uh, you know, is uh, the, the population that they serve, you have to, uh, you know, identify as a native, in, including uh, indigenous Hawaiian. Uh, and, um, and then, uh, you know, many of uh, the artists that they serve tend to live in rural areas, which is very unique, anything from uh, Maine to Alaska to uh, anywhere you can imagine. And um, and then you have the, the polar opposite. You have often uh, arts incubators that actually operate a space that, you know, are a little bit landlocked. And so it's not a bad thing. It's not a negative thing. It's a, it can be a very positive thing. But it means that they tend to serve uh, communities that are adjacent to their space. And so, for instance, you know, the uh, Austin Music Foundation, in order to like go through their arts incubator program, um, you have to be a resident of the city of Austin, uh, as well as a musician. And so it's, um, that's so sometimes there are some restrictions, uh, you know, but that's also uh, based on, you know, their capacity. Um, it's the same thing with, uh, unfortunately, uh, an arts incubator that has closed its doors since, uh, which was C4 Atlanta, and, uh, you know, that catered to, uh, you know, BIPOC artists in Atlanta itself. Uh, so those are like, um, you know, different pattern. Every single um, uh, arts incubator has a very unique and uh, approach and serves, um, um, you know, its its own communities uh, in in very unique ways. I have not seen uh, any arts incubator duplicate, in, you know, any of the offerings or uh, tap into usually the same artists. So it's sometimes uh, artists choose to like, if they have a good experience with an arts incubator, they might go uh, and, and, uh, and, and participate in another. So that I have seen. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's wonderful because as I say, the offerings are completely unique. So you still benefit a great deal from uh, the learning experience here. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, one thing that, um, you know, kind of was um, perhaps disappointing, but, you know, not necessarily disappointing, but under understandable too, uh, most arts incubators don't have a large staff. They have a very small staff. And uh, so they are overstretched. And, uh, you know, since here we are talking about data and NADAC is, uh, is, all a, is a data repository, um, we, uh, what we've seen is only about 52% of the arts incubators surveyed uh, were keeping track of the performances and successes of their participants. So they're collecting data, uh, only about half of them did so uh, and had the capacity to do so. And when I, I was uh, doing interviews, and ask why you're not collecting data. And you know, usually the folks said, you know, we're overstretched, we don't have the time. So that was usually um, uh, what was going on here. Uh, so in instead of collecting data, perhaps the uh, efforts were um, directed somewhere else, perhaps on fundraising and so forth. Okay. Um, also, 30% uh, of the arts incubator are designed to serve historically underserved community. Um, it does not mean that the other 70% uh, don't serve, say, BIPOC or LGBTQ plus artists, but they are, don't necessarily uh, limit their scope uh, as to who they serve. Uh, but 30% of them, do, uh, they were very, um, uh, very mindful as to who they're dedicating their efforts and uh, their fundraising and uh, their services to. Okay, uh, next slide, please. All right, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so this is, um, we had a methodology of uh, addressing um, uh, who uh, the arts, in, how the, you know, what kind of um, um, elements of arts incubation these different arts organizations uh, acted upon. So for instance, uh, you know, we had uh, amongst the 147 um, 
you know, um, surveyed uh, arts incubator who responded to our survey. Um, we had one, a group of arts incubators that primary purpose was to serve as an incubator. That's all they did. That's the, the, the whole uh, point of what they did. They're very aware that they're arts incubators and they were not, uh, you know, creating as an arts incubator as part of other programs that were perhaps uh, not acting as an arts incubator. Uh, then you had organizations that, you know, offered multiple programs of different nature and perhaps one, at least one of the programs or components serves as an arts incubator in the community. Uh, and finally, um, we also uh, surveyed organizations that we noticed um, perhaps didn't offer the programming, but they were offering the funding for programming. So perhaps they were outsourcing the programming. So they were an organization that, you know, um, had, uh, you know, funding capacity, but did not have, uh, you know, the training in-house. They uh, outsourced the training. They had perhaps a partner uh, organization that was able to provide uh, that educational training in entrepreneurship and business to artists and uh, cultural organizations. Uh, so these surveys were distributed and collected by the Americans for the Arts uh, in their platform uh, to, uh, uh, you know, about 400 uh, arts incubators. So we felt pretty good that out of a sample of 400, we got 147 uh, respondents. So there was a lot of interest in our work. And, um, and then in between the, the months of September and October, we collected the data, and then we were able to uh, analyze the data, treat it, and pass through it uh, in the following few months. And so we'll talk a little bit about uh, the results. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what we've noticed is most arts incubators had uh, experienced a lot of sustainability. There was a lot of demand for the programs and for the, the services that they offered, and they've been in business for over 25 years. Many of them are like, you know, um, you know, uh, very much act as like almost case studies in the field as to, you know, what to do and how to be successful. Say C in San Antonio, which is a youth arts incubator that sort of middle schooler and high schooler uh, has been, you know, um, certainly uh, one of those cases that, um, uh, uh, that, you know, we, we hear from, you know, the founder, John Hinoyosa, who is on our technical group, um, uh, all the time, they they have a uh, you know they 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 serve students from the, the mostly the west side of San Antonio students who uh, are, are usually uh, you know at risk youth and um, hundred you know they have an amazing amount of success. Uh, the students you know complete the program. They have uh, they all graduate from high school. They have a hundred percent rate of uh, acceptance in college. It's really an amazing, an amazing program. Um, so a lot of these organizations have been in business for twenty-five or more years, uh, on average. Um, and then uh, the responding organizations also mentioned that uh, the operating budget, uh, what they had to work with in terms of expenditures for the, the current fiscal year that uh, we, we uh, collected the data for, uh, indicated that they had just a little bit under $400,000, so $375,000 on average. Uh, so some of them you know, had millions and uh, others had much less. Um, and then a median of about $45,000 was dedicated to the programming itself. Uh, so that's a lot of the time. Uh, the reason for that value is because a, a lot of the organization felt under that second category where the organization only offered at least one uh, you know, component or uh, an aspect of the programming that served as an arts incubator, perhaps not the entire arts incubator. Uh, the entire arts organization was an arts incubator. Um, also, uh, respondents provided a median of about $25,000 of funding in terms of scholarship, grants, loans, and so forth to participating organizations and individual artists. So there certainly is like a, 
you know, funding is one of the motivators for artists to take part in, as an attendee in or a participant in an arts incubation program. Uh, it is very um, um, attractive, certainly, to, especially if you need funds to uh, complete a project and uh, and move uh, your and elevate your career. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so 30% of the organization that participated uh, reported that their primary purpose was to serve as an arts incubator. So just about a third. Uh, and then, but most of the arts organizations did tend to have at least one element of our programming. And not all of the 15 organizations that we study, for instance, where uh, prime, their primary purpose was not necessarily to be an arts incubator, but they had arts incubation programs that were highly successful. And we were uh, fascinated by that aspect. Again, um, I want to reiterate that our definition of arts incubators and the type of programming they offer would have to like have that leadership, entrepreneurial, um, uh, and business skills type element that is geared towards uh, you know advancing the careers of uh, emerging you know early stage artists or uh, cultural organizations. Um, only 6%, however, of these, uh, of the organizations that we surveyed offered funding. So that means that uh, when uh, there's uh, funding that is offered, it's often um, by partnering organizations or, you know, or other sources. Um, but the, the 6% were organizations that only provided funding and um, to support the delivery of participation in an incubator, which was either one of those 30% or one of the 64%, you know, that uh, we have in here. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, on average, how many people participate in a program? That we, we thought it would be really interesting to know that information. Do they serve hundreds of artists every year, uh, or do they serve just a handful of artists every year? Uh, on a, the median number that we found is about, on average, like 40, 40 individuals go through um, uh, an arts incubator program, at least in the past year when we conducted the survey. And, um, uh, and then we also had, because it was in the midst uh, of COVID, we wanted to have some information about uh, what their plans were uh, moving past COVID. Uh, you know, 75% of the organization reported that they will continue to uh, provide access to physical space. It meant that about a quarter of the organization survey decided to divest the space and moved uh, either their programming entirely online or dedicate their efforts somewhere else. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so I guess at this point, uh, I'll take um, you know a few minutes to uh, walk you through uh, the report, which is hosted on the Americans for the Arts website. And uh, let me share my screen. Here we go. All right. So uh, if you go to the Americans for the Arts website, and you can uh, certainly Google as well uh, 2021 Profile of Arts Incubators, you'll find very easily this page. Um, it, it gives you a lot of the inf information that I already provided, but there is a lot more information. And I just wanted to like, you know, um, walk you very quickly through this and so that you have, um, you know, a sense of, you know, the kind of resources that are available here. There's a few tools as well that you, you're welcome to use. Um, so there is our full definition of what an arts incubator is. And this is the definition that we used um, uh, and uh, with uh, the Americans for the Arts, when we did the survey of the um, local arts agencies, and we crowdsources, uh, we crowdsourced where uh, who the arts incubators are, and uh, and so a lot of our data came from from uh, providing that definition to those organizations, and they helped us identify uh, a, a large 
portion of our um, of our database. Okay, and then um, you know there is a, a very uh, quick uh, description which I already indicated. There's a lot of most there's a lot more statistics about um, uh, you know the incubators themselves, and we we broke it down in different sections. So one is about infrastructure. So you know anything from incorporation to the type of services offered. Um, you know, and uh, and uh, you know, we wanted to see if incubators owned their space, where they rented their spaces, um, and we we only saw that only eight percent of incubators actually owned the space that they operated in, uh, and um, whereas fifty six percent had a partner um, organization or used in kind space in order to operate in. All right, uh, but we also had a section on financials, which I already like, you know, you know, kind of um, introduce you to. Uh, we have a whole section on programming and so forth. Now, not all the numbers uh, are, are listed here. If you want to dive into the, the data yourself, I have the raw data, which is available to you at this link here. So it's an Excel file that you are welcome to uh, dive into. Uh, you will also see. Uh, the uh, survey instruments, so the type of surveys that we sent out to, uh, that were um, sent out to the 400 arts incubators and 147 of them responded. If you want to see uh, what uh, the, the different participants are uh, and by state and location, uh, you have that information as well. Uh, so we wanted to like, you know, kind of like provide the information and, and as convenient uh, a, a um, format as possible. Um, I also included a photo album of uh, a handful of uh, arts incubators that, uh, you know, we visited. Uh, and um, most of those visits happened um, early this year. And uh, so they are available here and you can like kind of like see how how different the spaces are. But there are, there are a lot of commonalities in uh, how these spaces look. And uh, finally, um, you have uh, an interactive map that uh, has those 400 different incubators in here. I have it set up so that it has, you know, a clustering, uh, you know, variable in it. So as you see, you will have like larger nodes and uh, smaller nodes. Uh, you certainly can click on this uh, map and it will expand the map. You'll have legends. You can like, um, if you click, for instance, on uh, one of those clusters, you have the ability to browse the data. There's, uh, and as you click through, the data, you'll see a lot of information about all of these different arts incubators. Um, you know, if you are, this is built in Arc GIS. Uh, if you are familiar with using this platform, you have also the ability to have a drop down of the entire table with all the data. So that's uh, a very useful way of using this. You, if you zoom in, uh, the clusters, you know, become uh, individual dots and you have like the ability to like see a, a little bit uh, more of the data if you are interested in a particular region of the United States over another. Okay. Um, we also had a couple of word clouds because we wanted to have a sense of, um, you know, what the perception of arts, uh, the, the arts incubator, uh, what was the reception from participants? You know, we wanted to say, hey, you know, what do usually folks uh, say about uh, our incubation programming. So that comes again from the raw results that you have access to on this page. Uh, but we sometimes those were, um, you know, entire sentences or descriptives, uh, and, uh, and so we wanted to to show, uh, you know, you know what you know, how, how uh, actually the, the, the incubator perceive themselves, uh, the work that they, they produce, and then what their future plans were. So we wanted to kind of know um, what they wanted to do. We see words such as losing training program. They didn't want to have that. Maybe uh, doing some um, new programming, you know, maybe increasing the number of participants. Um, you know, expansion of the space or divesting the space. Um, 
you know it's it's uh, very interesting to see uh you know some of them like uh, we're thinking of expanding perhaps their social media uh you know um uh, exposure and so forth um or perhaps grant funding was uh, something that uh, made sense. Uh, some of them wanted to either operate it purely on a volunteer base and were seeking to, um, you know, now be able to pay their staff and so forth. You also had access in this, uh, uh, you know, um, profile of Arts Incubator, the 2021 profile on this page by the Arts of uh, the Americans for the Arts. You have all, uh, several of the infographics that you saw throughout this presentation, but you have others, and you're welcome to like click on them and download them and use them for your own purpose. Uh, we wanted to like give you some options here. And uh, finally, there are a couple of articles. Um, one of them has um, uh, is includes additional maps. So if you want to see data uh, related to, um, you know, the work of some of the incubators with studies and, and, and the artists and uh, using uh, some of the American community survey data and demographic and uh, economic data. Uh, a lot of that information is available in this network effect, uh, um, you know, article. The second one is a wonderful tool. If you feel that you are struggling with digital divide issues, uh, meaning internet problems, you know, uh, in understanding that, um, you know, uh, serving as an access hub, is, internet access hub is not as easy as we think it is. It's expensive. And also, there is a big difference in between uh, upstream and downstream and understanding these kind of uh, words, but also seeing the maps and uh, it, there is entire tools to explore digital divide in uh, all sorts of communities. I, uh, uh, included lots of different layers of data in here. There's about 25 different layers of data that you can explore. Uh, anything from the Microsoft data to the uh, federal, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, commission uh, data in, in here. So there's a lot of very, very interesting things. Um, so I think, I hope that you find this uh, interesting and uh, that, you know, it's useful to you. Uh, again, it's completely at, you know, it's public information. You, you're welcome to use any of this data for your own purpose. Thank you. Now I'll stop my sharing. And now we're happy to take your questions. Looks like there are a few that are already in the Q&A box. Um, so we'll start with those. Uh, the first one is, how much funding is needed to start an arts incubator? What are the most common means of raising that those initial funds? And how are post-launch operating funds typically raised or earned? Uh, well, you know, again, every incubator is unique. So uh, depending uh, if this is already an existing organization that wishes to add a pro, you know arts incubator program to their already existing uh you know offerings it, it might be like a lot less expensive uh than it is to launch an arts incubator from scratch from the ground up um also i didn't like speak much of arts incubator programs that uh you know live at universities and serve either the students from the university or the community. Uh, usually it's not both. Um, okay, so in terms of funding, um, from the, the research, I saw that if you want to have a nonprofit that is, you know, sustainable, usually about $200,000 of operational funding will be uh, probably like uh, uh, enough to like have paid staff and programming and so forth. Uh, in terms of uh, means of raising the funds, it can come from different places. Sometimes um, it's um, um, there will be grants. Sometimes it will be donors. Uh, sometimes it will be um, you know loans or seed fund capital. Um, so there's different options here. I did not see like the the other 
questions as part of that particular uh, set of questions. Do you have other questions? The other part of that question was about raising um, follow-up funds, but there are um, two other questions in the um, Q&A box, so I'll ask you those two as well, and knowing that yeah. we have about four minutes left, you can pick and choose. Okay, um, so I, yeah, I see few incubators on this base. Yes, very few. Uh, is there a concern about sustainability at all? Well, it all depends how, you know, what's your point of view? You know, I, I think, uh, you know, owning a space, you know, you, you have to like maintain the space you have, you know, if anything goes wrong with it, it's expensive to like maintain space. So sometimes being asset poor and not having a necessarily a space, it is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, what I've seen with uh, many arts incubators during the COVID time, they were able to like let their space go and not pay rent during the time when uh, and have a space be vacant and then rent a different space. So there is a concern about sustainability if you don't own your space because you are the mercy of a landlord. Uh, also, depending where you have a space, I mean, real estate, you know, very greatly in different places. San Francisco is a lot more expensive to rent a space than, say, Oklahoma. So, um, you know, it all depends where you're located. And if you feel that space is an issue, uh, many very successful arts incubators operate purely online now. Or uh, only, uh, you know, work with partners when they need a space, they, they get a space in a community that they want to serve uh, artists in. And the programs don't have to be all year long. They can be like, uh, you know, in condensed uh, uh, format. They can be a weekend boot camp. They can be uh, a couple week program. They don't have to be all year long programs all the time. Uh, can you offer any conclusion or recommendation after doing this survey? Um, yeah, uh, what I've seen is, unfortunately, some incubators have gone out of business. And usually when we think about our organizations, uh, you know, struggling, we always think that it's a financial issue. Uh, what I've seen in the, in, the, in the results is that often it actually was uh, a when the initial leadership, the, the person who was either the founder or the co-founder, you know, um, left and there was, you know, uh, the division was discontinued. And that's usually when, uh, you know, these organizations crashed and burned. So uh, leadership is and vision is, is very, very important. Um, you know, of course, funding is essential. Um, depending, you know, I mean, F fundraising for an arts incubator is no, dif no different than fundraising for any other arts nonprofit. It's, uh, you know, very similar, especially if you serve the youth demographic, it will be a lot easier, I would think, to like raise funds then. Uh, but also, you do not have to be set up as a 501c3. So one way of raising funds is to uh, earn uh, contributed, uh, you know, uh, earnings from, you know, renting space. So very much operating as a business. Um, so uh, a for-profit business and, um, you know, those organizations have been highly successful. Um, so those are perhaps some of the recommendations I have. Is there any other question? I think that was the last question and we're right at two o'clock. So um, I know that uh, people probably need to head on to their next meeting or presentation. Um, but I wanted to say thank you for this. This was a super informative and interesting presentation. Um, and Anya, do you have any last words to close us out? No, I just wanted to um, show this last slide with some information about NADAC where you can find out more uh, about what we do. Uh, find FAQs and tutorials, subscribe to announcements. And I also want to thank uh, Dr. Renard for such a wonderful presentation and everyone who joined us to here today. And uh, hopefully you can join us again in April. So thank you and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Take care. Thanks.